Hi, and welcome to video 3.2, where we're going to be talking a little bit more about chemical bonding and nomenclature. So in our last discussion about ionic bonding, we were involving metals bonding to non-metals. And the idea was that metals have few valence electrons, and they tend to lose those electrons, whereas non-metals tend to have a high number of valence electrons and want to gain electrons. So when we get a metal and non-metal together, we're going to see a transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. And the result of that transfer leaves the metal with a full valence shell, but now a positive charge, there's a cation. The nonmetal has gained that valence electron, now has a full outer shell, and it has a negative charge. The consequence of that positive and negative charge is, of course, that they now attract one another. Electrostatic forces pull them together. So today we're going to talk about what happens when we bond nonmetals to nonmetals. So I've made a different type of diagram here showing two electrons in the first principal energy level, eight in the second, and seven in the third for both of these. And we know that nonmetals want to fill their valence electrons by taking electrons from someone else. Those nonmetals of their electrons. So when I get a nonmetal and nonmetal together, ooh, um, what's going to happen is one nonmetal is what. What's going to happen here is that one nonmetal is going to try to take the electron from the other nonmetal. So this little nonmetal over here is thinking, boy, I sure would like that electron over there. So he starts pulling it towards himself. That's what electrons do. Yeah, that's what nonmetals do. Now this one over here tries to steal the electron from the other one. So they have this tug of war going on. Each one's trying to steal a valence electron from the other. And what do you think happens? Those electrons become trapped between the two as they fight for them. Now, each nonmetal has access to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons there, because each one is holding on to those two electrons very close. So essentially they're sharing for them. They're sharing them. I really don't like to think about that as sharing. I think about it as trying to fight for them, but they're locked into this new thing which we call a covalent bond. And now this thing has become what we call a molecule. So a good definition for a molecule, nonmetals that are bonded together by sharing valence electrons, or fighting for valence electrons, to complete their outer shell. And again, the trick here is that it's got to be between nonmetals if we're talking about a molecule. So as we look at our PowerPoint, the covalent bond is the sharing of electrons between two nonmetals. The covalent bond is a fight for more electrons, whereas an ionic bond is really the transfer. And when we think about why, we have to think about that electronegativity difference. Nonmetals have high electronegativities. They have strong attractions for electrons. And they form this bonded unit called molecules. When we talk about the formula and names of molecular compounds, we're going to name the element with a lower electronegativity first. So the one that's more to the left or further down gets named first. Then we're going to name the second less metallic element, changing its suffix to IDE as we did with the ionic monatomic ions. Since nonmetals often combine in different proportions to form a number of different compounds, prefixes must be included in the names to indicate the numbers of each kind of atom present. We never use the prefix mono for the first element, however. We only use that for the second element, if only one atom is present. So let's take a look at some examples here. So here are four different compounds that contain nitrogen and oxygen. All are different, and we can't really look at the periodic table and say, if nitrogen bonds to oxygen, here's what's going to form, because it depends on the conditions in which they're formed. But clearly, 
nitrogen and oxygen can bond in different ways. So we need a nomenclature procedure that's going to tell you which of these species we're actually talking about. So this first top one I'm going to call nitrogen dioxide. Di means two. Why? I have two oxygens. The second one, we're going to call dinitrogen monoxide. Dinitrogen because there's two nitrogens, monoxide because there's only one oxygen. And again, we only use mono for that second element if there's only one. We didn't use mononitrogen up here because that's the first element. The second one, or this third one, We're going to call dinitrogen tetraoxide. Tetra is for four, like tetras, four blocks falling. Dinitrogen, two nitrogens, tetraoxide, four oxygens. This last one would be called nitrogen monoxide. One nitrogen, one oxygen. So let's take a look at these prefixes. We have the prefix mono if we're talking about one unit. And again, we only use that for the second element in the compound. Di means two, tri means three, tetra is four, penta is five, hexa is six, hepta is seven, octa, eight, nana, nine, and deca is ten. So let's practice naming a few compounds here. SO2 would be called sulfur dioxide. PCL3 would be phosphorus trichloride. SF6 would be called sulfur hexafluoride. H2O, dihydrogen monoxide. We can call it water. CO, carbon monoxide. CO2, we know, is carbon dioxide. So let's come up with some formulas based on these names. Phosphorus pentachloride. The kids have one phosphorus and five chlorides. Dinitrogen trisulfide. Dinitrogen would imply two nitrogens. Trisulfide, three sulfurs. Arsenic dibromide. One arsenic and two bromines. Don't think that would work, but hey, neither would this. Disulfur pentoxide. Well, it's telling me disulfur pentoxide. Pent is five. Carbon monosulfide. Hmm. Well, one thing we can be sure this is so simple a child could do it. And what's important to remember in this particular bonding type, this covalent bonding, the molecular bonding, it involves nonmetals, only nonmetals. We do not have a metal in the compound. So when it starts with a nonmetal, other than hydrogen, which we'll talk about in a second, <coughs> when it starts with a metal other than hydrogen, which we'll talk about in a second, it is going to be a molecular compound that's where we're going to use our prefixes. The last thing we're going to talk about are acids. Acids are hydrogen ions bonded to some anion. So it could be a monatomic element like a chloride, a bromide, an iodide, or it may be a polyatomic ion like a nitrate or a sulfate or a phosphate. When hydrogen is acting as the cation, we're going to refer to this as an acid. Now, when we take these acids and dissociate them into solution, the hydrogens and the anions dissociate from one another. So all acids are going to be in an aqueous environment. They're going to be dissolved in water so we can get that dissociation to occur. So here would be some examples of acids. You'll notice that hydrogen is acting as the cation, and each one of these has a specific anion that hydrogen is bonded to. Now, if the polyatomic ion actually has a negative two charge, then it would require two hydrogens. If it added a negative three charge, it would require three hydrogens. These guys have negative one charges, so we'd only need one hydrogen. We have as many hydrogens as we need to bring it up to being electrically neutral. 
Let's talk about the names of these things. Our acid nomenclature has got some kind of weird rules, but they don't change. Let's go through those. If the anion that the hydrogen is bonded to does not contain an oxygen, it will be hydroblanchic acid, where the blank is the anion root. For example, HBr is called hydrobromic acid. The root is bromine, so it becomes bromic acid. HCN is called hydrocyanic acid. CN is the cyanide ion, so our root is cyanic, hydrocyanic acid. If the anion does contain oxygen, then we change the anion suffix from ate to ick or ite to us. If you put that all together, it sounds like a disease. Atic itis. Ate to ick, ite to us. Then we add the word acid, indicating that hydrogen is the cation. So it is then a blank acid. So HNO3 is nitric acid. HNO2 would be nitrous acid. Why? 8, NO3 is called nitrate, becomes nitric. NO2 is nitrite, so it becomes nitrous. 8 to ick, ite to us. So let's talk about the names of these guys. Does this contain an oxygen? No. So it becomes hydroblankic acid. What is our blank? Bromic because I have bromine, and we add the word acid. Does this contain oxygen? Yes, it does. So we do not use hydro. It's going to be blank acid, okay? We're gonna use the anion root to figure out, the anion root to figure out what the name is. So we look at our polyatomic ion sheet. This is called the acetate ion. Eight gets changed to Ick. Eight to ick. And then we add the word acid. So this becomes acetic acid. That's the stuff in vinegar. This one. Does it contain oxygen? No. So it becomes a hydro something acid. Hydro what? Hydro chloric acid. Does this contain an oxygen? Yes. So we're not going to use hydro. Let's use our polyatomic ion sheet and see what ClO2 is. Ah, that's called the chlorite ion, I-T-E. Ites get changed to us. So this becomes chlorous acid, changing the ite to us. This one. Does it contain oxygen? Yes. So we're not going to use hydro in the name. This is called the sulfate. It gets changed to ick. You're thinking sulfic acid. We actually call it sulfuric acid. That's the same with the phosphate ion. It becomes phosphoric acid. Sulfate, phosphate, um, sulfite, and phosphite as well. For example, this guy. That is the sulfite ion, SO3. So we make this sulfurous acid. So again, if it does not contain oxygen, it's hydroblankic acid. If it does contain oxygen, we change eight to ick or i to us to that anion, and then we add the word acid. Again, so simple a child could do it. So we have three very different naming procedures here. One for ionic, one for molecular, and then we have a third for acids. So how do we know when to use them? Well, let's just look at how we're going to know what type of bonding it has. If the formula starts with a metal or ammonium, then it's going to be an ionic compound. If the formula starts with a nonmetal, it is molecular. And if the formula starts with a hydrogen, in most cases, it's going to be an acid. That's going to dictate which procedure we use. One last point on naming. Honkelbreath. That's hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and fluorine. 
Those elements in Honkabrith are what are called diatomic, meaning that they exist in pairs. So hydrogen, when it's by itself, is H2. Why? Because it's part of Honkabrith. So I'm talking about bromine. Bromine is Br2 when it's by itself. Why? Because of Honkabrith. When I talk about magnesium, it's just Mg. Why? Because it's not part of Honkabrith. So these Honkabrith elements are diatomic. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and fluorine. One of the last pieces of information we want to talk about is the types of chemical reactions that we're going to be seeing. The first one is decomposition. That's where I take something and break it apart into smaller pieces. So AB is becoming A and B in the decomposition reaction. The opposite of that is the synthesis reaction, where I'm taking smaller pieces, A and B, and putting them together to make a larger structure. Like photosynthesis is an example of a synthesis reaction. Single replacement is when A is bonded to X, B is by itself, then B steals X away and leaves A by itself, and B is now with X. Kind of reminds me of being in high school. I was like, A. As soon as I got a girlfriend, she'd take off and date B. I'd be all alone. Now, double replacement is more like the soap operas, where A is bonded to X, B is bonded to Y, and then, at the end, A is bonded to Y and B is bonded to X. They've changed partners. So it's a double replacement when each starts with a partner, it's a single replacement when one of them is all by itself. Poor Mr. Lockery. A couple notations. You will see these in the lower right of substances sometimes. For example, you may see NaCl and a little S next to it. That's indicating that that substance is, as a sol is existing as a solid. You may see, for example, H2O with a little L next to it. That's a liquid. O2 is a gas. Hey, we just learned about why it's O2 a second ago, because of Honklebrit. Or we may see something like this, NaCl with an AQ in its lower right. That means aqueous. The root of aqueous, aqua, means water. So this is a sodium chloride that's been dissolved in water. It's different than a liquid, because a liquid would be a pure substance. We could melt sodium chloride and have liquid NaCl, but in this particular case, we've simply, divide, we've simply dissolved it into water. Thus, it's aqueous. And that wraps up our discussion on chemical bonding and nomenclature for Unit 3. I will see you for practice soon. Thank you very much, and have a great day.